Hi, I'm Joel Devell, and I thought I'd make another video about the 208, and in this video, about the program interface, or you might say the card slot. I think if you know a lot about the card slot, you understand a lot about the easel and the 208. So I thought we'd dive into that. A lot of sales videos are usually about how to create a complex voice, and yes, there's a low-pass gate, but it's important to me to know about what how this works. If you understand the card slot, even if you don't use it, it'll inform you a lot about how this works. And um, I'll touch upon various things you can use a card slot for. Um, and if you have one of these old cards, I'm gonna make a second video about how to select resistors for it. But I'm gonna use this card to demonstrate various things about the card slot. So. I hope you enjoy this. I hope it's informative. Um, this is always an adventure when you know more about how it works. It's even more pleasant. So let's go on that journey. Okay, what is this card slot? It's obviously this blue plastic card slot that has about 56 contacts on both the front and back. It is uh, just like in 1973. It actually is, in that case, a card slot plugged into a card slot as a way to get the signals from the top card slot onto the board that it was controlling. Now, I changed the implementation recently to use a card slot that's a little more independent, uh, that allows you to pull it out and then embed one of these cards so that you can get some direct control. Uh, this is a program manager that's embedded and you can still keep the card slot on top. Uh, in this case, it would be for, if you had a program manager, say in a modern easel, you could then put the controls for the display and the switches over to the left and send that to that embedded card. That allows you to keep the card slot and also have a program manager. Now, chronologically, what we have here is we first have these cards that are these, like these blank cards here, or this card that's all soldered up. In 1974, this is how you might perform. You would throw this card in uh, to get your different sounds uh, as you're performing, and you'd throw it into remote mode, get what's on the card, or throw it in both mode. And in 19... Actually, in 2013, we updated this to the um, iProgram card. Now, this has an iPad app that allowed you to make virtual connections that way, and um, also through USB and for or through Wi-Fi. And that was a nice way to do it. You could move through 24 different patches. Um, and then there was the aux card, which you created to um, supplement what was missing on the original 208, that is, we didn't have attack, sustain, and decay controls like we do now. Um, it also gave you a few pulsing options, another oscillator. Now I gave you an LFO if you have the modern, um, but it, this gives you an, a potentially an LFO or another sound source that you could plug into the AUGS input, which is why it's called the AUGS card. And as I'll explain later, uh, a way to actually control some of the switches through CVs um, as well. Now, if you wanted to use both the AUGS card and the program card simultaneously, that is the iProgram card, or actually any program card, you could actually plug it into this card doubler, which fits both of them, and it actually also gives you potentially a firmware card input if there's a reason you might need that. So that was that. Uh, I that's around 2016. Then uh, I simplified the implementation of the iProgram card into the program manager card, took away the Wi-Fi, gave you USB, but we I improved it with an app that gives you a few more options and increased double the number of presets that you could save here. I also provided a instant access, instant recall to your patches instead of having to go in order. Uh, and like I said, this has the weird thing of having connectors on the back that don't seem to do anything, but that's because that's what's used to embed it into the system on the back. So now you have that card. Uh, then you have the third-party cards, you know, as Sasha's got a nice little thing there. And um, 
whatever you can do with that. So that is what the card slot physically is. So let me talk about now how it kind of works. I also want to quick, quickly acknowledge that the name, if you remember, I've pointed out before that the 208 is the stored program sound source, right? So it was important, the card slot was important because Don really appreciated live performance and he performed live with the Electric Weasel Ensemble using easels as their main uh, instrument. They did use some other modular bukla as well and acoustic instruments. But this, in combination with the cards, allowed them to recreate scenarios and setups, basically programs that uh, allow the implementation of pieces that would have otherwise been very difficult uh, to do in the early 70s. So that history is important as well. Um, so let's dive in. Okay, so let me explain what's actually happening here with the 208. This is a current controlled system. That is, the way this behavior is working is there is current flowing through this fader, these faders, this fader to control the behavior, this one, this one, and the pitch. So every other fader there is a current source that is flowing through it and also the wave shape and um, the also the switches. So these switches are a little different. I'll explain later, but these switches, whether the keyboard is on or off, what the wave shape is and what the modulation is, what the this wave shape is as well, and what these modes are for these switches are also controlled by the current flowing through them. Also the even the source switch uh, that is the case as well. So all of that is con the current source comes from the local mode 10 volts. Now I create it in both mode and it'll behave exactly the same because it is still getting its current from the local mode source, the local source of current. Now, when I throw it into remote mode, everything stops. And that is because I have, the flow of current has ceased to go through those faders and those switches. And so you get nothing. This will not do anything. And this will not do anything. However, if I throw a card in, I can then get them to behave. Now these still won't be active. And there's a reason for that. Um, so, of course, the reason you want it to not be active when you're remote is so that you could use, say, this traditional card. This is one that I made up from a photo of an Alan Strange card that he did in the 70s. And if I throw it into remote, it has its own behavior. And we want maybe that behavior to be completely different as it is now, then it's in that mode. So we jump between the two exclusively. Now what we could do is actually, we could send it into remote, then put it into both mode and get sort of a mixture of the two. So we end up with three different modes. There's this mode, which is adding the currents from what's going to the card and coming back with what is also on the front panel. So this is what's on the front panel. Again. And this is what's on the Ellen Strange card. Now you'll notice one interesting thing. He has a random thing happening with the period that's patched in. It's obviously not patched here, but that's how it would work. So we go into local mode and it's just a set. Number. Now, if I go into both mode, it's actually going to be additive. It's going to add the current from the card to the position that is here. It's as if I'm doing that. You'll hear that. So it's as if I'm pushing it as fast as possible. So even though that's that slow, suddenly it becomes very fast. Now, I could sort of compromise and go, well, musically, it's nice if it's maybe here. 
that's still faster than the card here. That's because it's adding the current from here and there. Now, in case you can't see this in the other videos, uh, this control switch here has three different colors, green for local, red for remote. Now that helps with people who are accidentally in remote mode because in the old version, there was no LED associated with this. And um, I thought it would be nice to indicate why you might, uh, nothing might not be happening on your system. Uh, that used to happen to people and they would want, they would even happen to me. I would switch into remote accidentally. So um, that shows you in remote mode. And then of course, the combination of green for local mode and the red for remote mode when you're in both mode becomes a yellow hue. Now there is another thing that is also happening when you put it into local mode and that is these bananas outputs are of course active but when you throw it into remote mode not only does the behavior of, of these change uh, because it's no longer getting current to these faders, but the outputs of these also turn off. Let me explain. For instance, there is an exception with the envelope generator in that this switch is not controlled either by the card. Well, it can be controlled by the card based on how much current goes through for sustain or transient. However, in self mode, you're sort of on your own. In self mode, it just runs. So you can hear it working in, in local mode, but as soon as I run to remote, even though you can see the light for the envelope is going on and off, and though you can tell it's much slower because it's as if these faders are all the way down, um, it is still running. So that should be generating an output that goes to this input. And I'll show you how that works in a second. But for instance, also in local mode, I have control over the pressure this pressure is going through here, it's being sent out, this purple banana controlling the amount of the mod oscillator. Right, so when I go to local remote mode, I'm still sending that pressure, as you might be able to see with the purple, uh, the violet uh, LED. We no longer have anything being sent here. Now, well, you might say, well, that's because the inputs are also off, but actually the inputs are on. And I'll explain that in a moment. So that means that when you go into remote mode, not only is current not flowing through those faders, but it also is not being sent out any of these colored bananas on the bottom side. Now there is an exception. Like I said, the exception is that these are actually active. That means that the mod oscillator will make the pitch go up and down because the input is still active and the output is even active if it's one of these bananas on the top. If I can make it louder, because this one envelope out is also active. Now, um, I can control this envelope. It's actually detecting the noise because there's nothing else plugged in here. So it's using the noise as a source. So you can actually use this switch to generate zero volts, essentially, you know, low voltage, not zero maybe one or two, this is maybe five or six, and this is about 10. If you want a switch controller voltage and have no other use for this envelope detector. But uh, so you have control from those, but these are off. The envelope out will do nothing, even though the envelope LED is on. So those are the exceptions. You may have also noticed, if you're looking carefully, that this range is in high mode, but it is not affecting the mod oscillator. That's because, like I said earlier, this is controlled by the current that is no longer getting. When is this? Now, if I throw it into both mode, then it has an effect. So let's see what happens now when you go and throw it into remote, right? When you throw it into remote, nothing happens because there is nothing on this card. Now, if there was something in that card, something would happen. For instance, okay, so I'm back in local mode. 
I have to reinitiate the pulser. That's, and or I could show you more. Right, you'll always get a sound. That way. If you go quick enough, by the way, the pulser will still have its uh, a little charge to it. But if you're in remote for a little bit of time and you come back, there's nothing. Now we take care of that on the program manager. We give it a little um, boost. But if you're using a raw card, you might have to do that. So here we are. What we're going to do now is like show you how just flipping that switch changes the behavior quite a bit. Again, let me demonstrate how the inputs actually still are active. So here we have a local mode. I've got these turned up and it's a very static patch here. But if I throw into remote mode, nothing happens. That's because now none of these are up. Well, this is slowly fading out. And, um, oh, there's a reason for that. And that is because uh, velocity is now plugged in to this input. So yeah, that's active. I've got pulse into this input. I've got the pressure directly into this input, not going through here, through the buffer. And I've got pitch going directly into this input. So actually, now in remote mode, even though there's nothing on the card, I can actually still play something. And I can control the, the timbre with pressure. Of course, etc. If I wanted to, I could control the modulation with this or whatever. So, in other words, external control allows me to do that, even though the keyboard essentially is is off. I'm going directly into the CV input pitch for just. Now, the other thing is that even though this source, if you listen to this, it's still this oscillator, but this isn't doing anything. But it's not the modulation oscillator because even though this is in the middle, all these switches are acting as if they're on the bottom. That is, I don't get a LPG mode unless I control this switch with current. I only get the VCA mode. Now, let's explain one more thing. So, I'm in local mode. I have this nice little patch going. It's responding to the keyboard as well. But I can use, uh, let's say, just a regular card and enhance the behavior by adding what's happening with the card. And this is just with two resistors. Actually, this one isn't even plugged in. And this one is only sitting in there. Now, if I pull that out, it's still a little different because I soldered in a resistor for level. So now you notice the level is constant. Even if I pull that down, if I go back to remote mode, I mean local mode, it's behaving that way. Now, if I again, if I go to both mode, and if I was to put a resistor in here, and I would solder this normally, of course, I've added the pitch offset that's coming from the control voltage, well, and that's in the form of current going through the offset through a resistor here to pitch. So now I've created two different ways to play this. And uh, you'll notice in both mode, it works fine. Now if I run to local mode, all I have is the level and the pitch, nothing else is happening. I don't even have keyboard control. Uh, that would require this resistor. So if I put that resistor in there, Now I have keyboard control, it was as if I turned this switch on virtually. So hopefully that makes sense now, because now I'm actually sending current to this thing called offset, and that will determine what the fader positions actually are, is what resistors are soldered in here. Now, what is this about voltage control, or really current control of the switches here? Um, well, if you take a traditional card, you'll see that there is a space for, for instance, on this mod oscillator, which we're listening to now. 
a wave shape or WS. So if there's nothing in there at all, it's as if the wave shape is is down here, is pulled down. Remember how he said switches, if they're in the downward position, are the same as a blank. So that is would be a uh, triangle wave. Now on this one, there's actually something in there, so that's going to be a different wave shape. Now we can do the same thing with a, a, now this is a static voltage, so there is an offset voltage that's going here, it's 10 volts, and depending on the resistor you put in there, it restricts the current to determine what switch position you're going to get from the, from the mod oscillator. Now if I do this another way, I could actually uh, send a voltage to the two card input here, from say here, which I'm controlling here, and I could send it to the card slot. Now, on a card, you now have a position called two card. There's two card. There's card two and there's card one. In the old cards, they were called uh, by the names of the sections they were in the in inverter section, envelope detector section. But we no longer uh, we simplified it. Uh, I changed the name uh, to card two, card one, and I named it also on here likewise. So I would uh, then take that signal that's coming in here and I'm going to control it now. Right now it's not going to anything, but I, with the aux card I can actually switch it to control the wave shape. So current is really the same control, it's just that now this is a fixed resistor but a changing voltage. Okay. I can also do the same thing with the source. I could change, so that's as if I'm switching this up, right? But virtually. I can do the same thing with the source switch. Did you hear this? Pretty different. So now I can... I'm switching that. So that's another switch that's uh, controlled. Um, I can also control these, control this wave shape, like I said. All of those can be controlled. So, um, and then you can send it to something else, like random. switches. Just to refresh, the outputs do not go to the card. So actually this input here to the card then does not get sent out if I'm in local mode. For instance, I'm in local mode, I have no control over the wave shape. However, if I go into both mode, So anybody who's wondering why I have set the program manager to have four modes, not just a standard both mode, is that I want it to be such that this mode still exists where the remote uh, program is not yet engaged, but you have control over the outputs that go to a card like say this or one of these cards or a third party card. Now here's one other thing I'd like to point out. Um, if you've noticed, when you go into remote mode, a lot of different things can happen. 
But how does that happen with if you just had a card like this? And if it's not obvious already, it's because this card is not doing any of the pulsar generation or envelope generation or random generation. All it is doing is making the connections, controlling what's happening uh, based on the fader positions from the offset and connections made with resistors. For instance, this envelope generator is going to the level in this on the card. However, there is a couple of exceptions. One, if you're using a program manager, that is still the case except for the sequencer, which is being generated by virtual faders from the app and stored on the preset on the program manager, and also random. Now, the reason that random is particularly useful to be that way is because unlike uh, the randoms from here, the randoms are a, a slightly more authentic random being generated here. Not only that, but you get four independent randoms on the card using the app as opposed to using the card. The reason is on the card, only two of the randoms are sent via the card slot. So even though you get four on the front panel, only the first two are sent to the card here. So those are the two exceptions. So one of the things that means is even though you're summing the sequencer uh, normally when you go into both mode, uh, we certainly are summing the period, you're not actually summing the output here from here and the card simultaneously because the card is generating its own sequencer patches that are then going to its oscillator and making the connections to the oscillator components. I think I'll also mention that something else physically has changed about the card uh, since 2013. That is that there are actually five more signals on this card than there were in the original 1974 um, card slot. Actually, if you look at 1973, it's a different slot, so that's why I keep saying 74 instead of 73. Um, however, we've added five new signals. First, five volts, then uh, the control of the range of the mod oscillator and the mod out CV directly, same as the banana, and likewise of the envelope detector, a direct out. Now, those four were done with Don in 2013, but uh, later I uh, ran out of pins. We had used all the pins up, but I really wanted the card to know when it was in both mode. So because the card wasn't using sequencer five signal uh, and we weren't using it on that card, I stole sequencer five in order to send the um, sequencer, what would have been in the sequencer five pin to the card so it would know when it's in both mode. Now that's important because it allows you to go into uh, a both mode here and not confuse the switches. So the switches now become all local because if you sum the switches, it gets very confusing. So, uh, in fact, Don decided to remove both mode initially out of the 2013 one because it was too confusing and I realized there was a way around that. But we still have the local mode. So you have three modes here, right? But you also get a fourth mode which I realized if you don't engage the preset manager when you go into both mode, you get this additional control. If you listen to local mode versus this, that's because I'm now sending a control signal to this card to also um, take the signals that come from the two card and from the potentially from the other places, and being able to use them without engaging the program manager, which is especially important if you have an embedded system. You don't always want it engaged, but you still want to have maybe this card or even a third party card to be able to control these things that would, would, would go to the card, which I'll explain later. So if you're really desperate, you still want that sequencer five output, you can actually get it on this particular card. You have to cut the local control and short the sequencer to it, but it can be done. 
but I don't recommend it. If you do do it, you have to tape over one of the pins on this so you don't confuse this. It's doable though. So there you go. So that's what the card slot is, how it can be used. Now, like I said, you could use it simply to put a couple of resistors in to give you some variation um, from your local mode, or you could go full on, have a program manager or a card and switch into those modes and back and forth. You could even program one of these. And in the next section, I think I'm going to do a part two of this video, I'll make a second video that explains more about how you solder up one of these cards, what values you'd use, and uh, it could be a great teaching tool, actually. And also about resistors uh, generally. You know, uh, you can actually use uh, resistors in this case. I'm using it here to do a passive crossfade between whether it's only the envelope generator controlling the gate or the random. So it can be used as a way to mix things. Generally, one thing you can do on the card is you can generate, you can mix a little bit more of one thing than another uh, together into one source, uh, which is kind of nice. And this is one way I can do it here. You can do that generally by plugging two things into the same thing. That kind of works. Um, as well, although you don't quite have the, as much control over that. In this case, I've actually put a passive use this technique. What this uses is speaker cables that are not shorted together, so you can then connect whatever you want with the screw holes. Uh, so in this case, I've connected a wire that goes to this pot and another wire that's another resistor so allows me to do this